once it became clear after a couple of months that talk therapy was not doing it, she said, look, I need you to go to MAPS. I need you to look at the research because we have an opportunity. I live in Pennsylvania. We have an opportunity in Pennsylvania to uh, do that kind of therapy and let me know what you think. And um, I was so frustrated at myself and I was so sad. And I was getting to the point of being borderline suicidal because I was like, I'm completely safe. And yet I don't feel safe. And I don't want to live this way for the rest of my life that I just said, let's do this. The research on the website says that two thirds of the people through the clinical trials have no clinical symptoms. I'm willing to, I'm willing to roll the dice. So that's, that's really what happened. The talk therapy just wasn't making a dent. What story are you telling? Whether you're intentional about it or not, you have an audience and they think in story. The Doug Thompson podcast features diverse storytellers sharing their practical tips for telling the story they need others to envision and trust in order to take a new action. Here's your host, Doug Thompson. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to the Doug Thompson podcast. I am for one more time, Doug Thompson. Not that I'm going to change my name, but who the hell knows what goes on with that. I have the honor of interviewing, uh, used to be a coworker of mine back in the, the Evil Empire. Wait, well, one, one of the Evil Empire days. Um, and she's just a fantastic human and she's got a great story to tell as she would as Miss Jill Stitnick. How are you doing, Jill? I'm doing well, Doug. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And we we worked together for several years. We weren't on the same team, per se. We are an extended team. I didn't get to work as close with you as I'd like to have because you were just a fantastic human. I think the first time we met, we had an offsite. You had lost your husband not too long before that, I believe. And you were just so, you were just so impressive after such a... I said, that she's a... She's going to do things and you have done things. So tell us sort of a a little bit about your backstory there and how we got to where we're going to talk about today. Ah, well, I, I take that as a compliment. Thank you. Cause I think the first year or two, I was, I felt like a walking zombie. So the fact that I could actually put a sentence together was impressive to me. Uh, Well, actually the, the reason why I'm chatting with people on podcasts is when uh, my partner Carl passed away, I was devastated. Widow's fog was something I experienced. But 18 months after his passing, I had a massive panic attack, like a panic attack that would not go away. It was actually over the evil empire thing. It was a work <laughs> thing. But the reality was, is that my system had just hit rock bottom. I just couldn't handle anything else. And I had all of these feelings of dread that I was going to lose my job. I was going to lose my house. I was going to be living in my car that no matter, I I was never going to be employable again. I mean, I was in this really weird cycle panic attack that my world was crumbling. And I went back to my therapist who had helped me with my grief work. And I said, something's going on. I don't know what's what's happening here. And through a lot of discovery, and she at that point starting to learn about my childhood, which I had never talked about before, I was diagnosed with childhood trauma induced PTSD at 49. So that's why I wrote the book because the book concentrates on using psychedelic assisted psychotherapy over the course of a year. And I'm sitting here now and I no longer qualify for that diagnosis. Well, that's, so that's ag- my outstanding, very- outstanding. So, you know, I, I have those same, I've had those same feelings come across, you know, I'm going to be living on the street and, and at different times in my career, as you go through, you, you things sort of happen. But what, what made that, because I think we all have those irrational thoughts, you know, like give me a week or so and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll clear whatever thing is in my head that caused that. I mean, it takes a while for me to sort of understand my inner bullies starts talking and trying to get a leg up. And then, well, so what makes what, your situation, it was worse than that. That wasn't the normal thing. How did you sort of stumble across that? 
Right. I mean, you, you just, you just hit the nail on the head, like normal stress, things that bug you after a couple of days, you, you kind of go, you realize the world's not going to end. You were going to go on. Yeah. What made this different was that this didn't go away. And the physical I was in, and this is the way I describe it. I was in a fight or flight adrenaline rush for over a month before I went back to my therapist to be candid I was my stomach was upset I wasn't sleeping my neck was tight my body was telling me there's a problem my head was like we're yeah. fine <laughs> we're fine. Yeah. my body would not calm down and I didn't understand that I didn't understand the connection between trauma and the body until I went back to my therapist. So that's what it was. It just wouldn't stop. And then once you, once you sort of named it, right, you recognized and stuff, what it was, what, what, you know, what were the, what's the normal course of be, you know, treatment for that? Or, you know, did, did you try some of the more traditional, I guess, if you will, treatments for that? Um, so first of all, I will tell you that I argued with my therapist that there was no possible way I had PTSD. Yeah. Do you not see who you're dealing with? Type A Jill. So I'll send to your, so I'll say to your listeners, the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score by uh, Bessel van der Kroek. I read that book. And in that book is where I understood that I really did have some childhood trauma that was manifesting through my body. So I'll put that out there first. I really did not like the diagnosis. I didn't agree with it. I was like, yeah, I had a bad childhood, but like I was fed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I will tell you that the particular doc, my particular therapist is uh, very much in tune with the folks over at maps.org. They are the folks who have breakthrough therapy designation with the psychedelic MDMA for PTSD. So we didn't even, once it became clear after a couple of months that talk therapy was not doing it, she said, look, I need you to go to MAPS. I need you to look at the research because we have an opportunity. I live in Pennsylvania. We have an opportunity in Pennsylvania to uh, do that kind of therapy and let me know what you think. And um, I was so frustrated at myself and I was so sad and I was getting to the point of being borderline suicidal because I was like, I'm completely safe and yet I don't feel safe and I don't want to live this way for the rest of my life that I just said, let's do this. The research on the website says that two thirds of the people through the clinical trials have no clinical symptoms. I'm willing to, I'm willing to roll the dice. So that's, that's really what happened. The talk therapy just wasn't making a dent. It's, it's good that you realize that this wasn't making any progress. I think some people just, just feel stuck and then they take the, you know, the, 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 they, the way they see it, the only way out, which is very tragic a lot of times, instead of looking at it, okay, what are some alternatives that maybe <clears throat> on the surface sound out there and weird and, you know, can't, you know, can't work. Uh, you know, I, I've learned through meditation, a few of the other things that things I used to think were, were really out there aren't once you go, if you, if you go in with an open mind, you don't go with the preconceived notion. you say, you know, worst case is this doesn't do anything for me? Uh, you know, best case, this actually does solve a problem. And right. so, so it sounds like you, that's the attitude you took into that. I mean, I was 49 already and still and here you don't look over 29. Theory. I'm just saying, just, you don't look over 29. So I'll throw that out there. <laughs> uh, that's, that's why I'm doing this podcast. Uh, I was just frustrated. I was really frustrated. And here was a novel, here was a novel strategy that according to the clinical research had a track record of some success. So uh, that was, that was the reason to say yes. Well, cool. So walk us through that. What's like this first thing like? Yeah, you know, what's what's the what's the new employee or new patient treatment thing look like? What's what's the uh, yeah? <laughs> what's the onboarding? Right. Look what's like? the onboarding look like? So I had the privilege of working with my trusted therapist and a guide who is a medical doctor, and so I felt completely safe in terms of uh, the psychedelic 
situation, like I didn't feel like I was going to be in any sort of physical harm. So that was really important to me. My brain has gotten me through my life. I was never really into drugs because I didn't trust them that they wouldn't mess up my brain. So because it was my trusted therapist, I felt really good about it. So I think the first step is make sure when this therapy becomes legal, that you are working with someone that you trust, that you know, you have, has a background, has a track record. And then very specifically, uh, especially if you've read the Michael Pollan book, he talks an awful lot about set and setting and set means your mindset. This therapy works off of your intentions. And so my therapist and I spent a couple of months say, really crafting the intention for the journey. And for me, my intention was, I want to stop being so scared. I'm just so scared. I, I want this feeling to stop. And the setting is in a place, like not a hospital room, but like a medical room that looks nice, is comfortable. You're going to be laying down. I had um, an eye patch on or an eye mask on. Sometimes people put on headphones. Doug, you know me, I'm chatty. I was chatting the whole time during my journey, so I didn't have the headphones on. And my first two psychedelic assisted psychotherapy sessions were with the psychedelic MDMA. And MDMA is a relational psychedelic. Most people think of it like ecstasy. I had medical grade MDMA, so I was very comfortable with that. And what it did was, remember how I said before that the panic attack, I couldn't calm my body down. The MDMA calmed my body down. And so I was able to talk about some pretty horrific childhood stuff. My mother shot herself, my dad consistently abused me and my mother. Like there were some pretty bad things. And without my body going into fight or flight, I was able to start talking about my childhood. And then after the journey, the two or three months of integration, I would remember stuff from my childhood I wouldn't get into fight or flight. And suddenly I was able to look at the things from like an adult perspective. It would be like me looking at your life and giving you perspective and it making sense. But I had always felt, I had been remembering my childhood as a five-year-old, as a 16-year-old. I had all those trapped emotions and the MDMA let my body come down so I could very candidly look at those situations and realize that five-year-old was not at fault for protecting herself. That 16-year-old was did not blow up her life. Her parents, <laughs> her parents were not equipped. And so that's kind of in a nutshell, the intention for what you want to achieve, the nice room or space that's very safe. My journeys lasted anywhere from five to eight hours. So it is a long day. And then the two or three months, for me, it was every two or three months, really three months, kind of going through the integration and having these perspective shifts. And I knew I was ready for another journey when my body would start tightening up again, or I wasn't getting any perspective shifts. How'd that come out? It made sense in my head, but what 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 questions did I create? <laughs> no, I mean, well, that, you know, one of the psychedelic people, but... but it sounds like, and I'm going to sort of repeat back, I'm going to try to relate it to an exercise, an athlete and stuff on this one in that you, you get to in your case, well, I can't do it completely on that, but your body will get you to a point where you're, you have to completely almost like break it down to build it back up. But, but in your case, your subconscious, which is there to protect you, you know, it protected the five-year-old and the 16-year-old Jill by locking in this specific thing and almost building a wall around it, they talk about. And and you had to, and your body didn't want to let go of that because that was its protection, right? So it was sort of funny, not funny, strange in that it, it, it needed to be addressed, but it was holding it tight because that's what it knew. That was, that was the world it was familiar with. And by going through this, you broke through that wall so that you could look at it again, like you said, you looking at mine, which would be totally scary, by the way. But it, it's, it gives you a gave you a way to like I can look at this now from the outside 
from a from a more honest and a less a less you know fly or die frame of mind when you're that you didn't understand you couldn't do these in the frame of mind so that you got that out and that sort of broke that until you got to the next door that was sort of locked that you had to go through is that sort of what you yeah think? yeah you did a great and job getting of explaining to it then door, <laughs> getting to that next you did a great job doug um that's why we should have worked together more when we were, when we were in that empire getting to that door as soon as you said sports i was like he's going to talk about physical therapy because the easiest way I can explain the integration process is, you know, how you have, you have to do your stretching or you have to do your lifting when you're going through physical therapy. You have to put, I had to put the work in. I journaled, I meditate. I actually, when I walked the dog, I did a lot of meditation because I'm like a D minus meditation person. Um, but that, the PT part, or I guess in a sports analogy, the practicing part, super, super important for my healing. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it's the, the getting the mindset right of what you want to accomplish, getting very clear on that, because if you went in there with sort of this, then it's just a, it could be like an acid trip or something that went on. You're not, you're just sort of spun out and it's, it's just spin the wheel of fortune to see what was going to happen today. Is that sort of what it was? Can you talk about the mindset of setting very specific what you didn't want, what you wanted to accomplish? If you didn't have that set, would there, what, you know, what would happen? You know, I think that's a really great question. I've never done these kind of drugs recreationally, so I can't speak to that. And remember MDMA, so I should explain, I'm sorry. MDMA doesn't give you the fancy visuals. It's totally a, um, it increases the serotonin. It's very much a make you feel good kind of thing. That's why it's popular with, in raves and dances and things like that. You can be showing my age when I say dances. <laughs> So I think because, well, I should tell you, I, this might answer your question. My very first journey, my subconscious, my inner five-year-old was having none of it. So while I had set that intention of, I want to stop being scared, I had actually mentally shut that journey down after like four and a half, five hours. I mean, I came out of it like this. I was like textbook closed off scared person and that's okay because it was almost like my subconscious was kind of testing is this safe are these two adults here i had as a child i didn't trust adults so here suddenly i've got my subconscious kind of taking a look at these that i know this now i didn't know this then so even if my intention had been I want to stop being so nervous versus I want to stop being so scared. I'm not sure it would have mattered because, because I was going in with some sort of therapeutic purpose. You know, um, I wasn't going to a party and I just wanted to relax. Um, <laughs> that, is that yeah, no, it, it, it is. I, you know, I was just, I was just trying to, again, sort of walk through the process here. So as you did this, you, you said you went through some and you sort of get to this plateau resting place. You're good here. And you're ready to attack the next wall. So what was that like? I mean, was it similar to the first one? Was it different? <laughs> I will warn anybody who's going through a mental health. I call them injury. I think I had mental injuries to be candid. I think the trauma I had was injuries. I think we have to change the vocabulary. Uh, it's rough because you are, you're digging into wounds that never healed. So uh, my second journey was off the cuff of, I don't feel worthy. I, ch children who are abused, who never really get parent, parental love, deep down have a deep sense of not being worthy of anything. So I had that going on. I had this huge sense of, of isolation in my system. By the third journey, I had had a huge nightmare it, I had a huge nightmare about myself as a little five-year-old and here, this is going to show my age. Here we go. A little five-year-old with a Pac-Man head full of teeth. Like I didn't have a Jill head. I had this monster head. head full of teeth <laughs> in my childhood home. It was the weirdest dream ever. And it wouldn't go away. I kept having this image of this five-year-old just being so desperate to protect herself that she had to have like this monster face. 
And so my therapist and I kind of worked through it and we eventually got that little Jill to, you know, in my visualizations, in my meditations to be look normal and she couldn't get out of her childhood home. Couldn't get out in therapy, in dreams in meditation, literally there was no door. And so the intention, we knew something big was there. We just didn't know what it was. And so the intention for the third journey was, can we get little Jill out of her childhood home? An hour into that journey, my therapist and guide say, okay, are we ready to get Jill out of that house? And I turned around and said, which one? The one that's upstairs and dying or the one that's downstairs and is alive? And at that point, we continued to do some work. Like my subconscious had this little five-year-old malnourished Jill. I was like half the size of a normal kid. I was, I was in this white room. I was slumped over. And uh, my doctors, we had actually talked about it about three quarters of the way through that journey. We used a little bit of psilocybin, the magic mushrooms. That's what makes the visuals. We used a little bit of that. And uh, my childhood house disintegrated around me. I was able to get out of my house by doing that. Wow. So, and and yeah. then, so what happened after that, that after you got rescued Jill from the house? In immediate, so in the journey, I was actually in a garden, like the house kind of disintegrated around me. Like the walls kind of came apart. I still remember vision. I wasn't talking through it. I'm not sure how much you can talk when you're, I mean, I had two psychedelics in my system at that point. I, if there's but, somebody who could talk, you could talk. Just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I remembered it so vividly. I told my, my guides about it afterward. I was in this garden. I had this immediate sense of relief. And the integration after that third journey was much more visual, which was fascinating. I had this, this visualization of Jill at five kind of learning what life it was like she was free and she was learning what life was about outside of that house and eventually she kind of went away she the word is she integrated into me kind of thing uh, but it was that journey with the magic mushrooms or the psilocybin were that journey gave me much more visualization during the integration and uh, technically, after that journey, releasing that Jill, I was no longer diagnosed with PTSD. Yeah, I, I guess we're visual learners, we're auditory learners and stuff. And sometimes you need that that visualization when you're when you're. They call it that for a reason. When you're trying to think about before Olympic athletes do it, you know, I do. You, you're. They went through the. If you watch them at the top of these mountains, which you know just being up there would kill me just from lack of oxygen, but you're watching the speed and you watch them. They're just sort of weaving back and forth, going through, seeing themselves getting through the gates and stuff. So much like you need that piece of it to complete, you know, you, you can tell yourself you're going to, you know, I'm going to move left, move, but in, sometimes you just have to have that extra component. It sounds like that was the, the key. Yeah, I think that needs to become my personal opinion and my opinion and a dollar bill, get your cup of coffee somewhere it, where I live, cup of coffee somewhere. Uh, I think that we need to normalize the idea of visualization in therapy, because when it first happened, when I first kind of had these, you know, much more vivid, I immediately reached out to my doctors and was like, am I okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, short yes, here. <laughs> you, you can tell reality from your mind. Your mind is healing, go with it. And maybe that's just the way that my brain works. I don't know. That was just my experience. It was much more visualization on the third journey. I think it's somewhat of, of, a, of a, a brain that's maybe healing and this, it probably works that way. Um, I, I'm no doctor. I didn't, didn't sleep at a holiday in, but I'm just, I'm just thinking knowing your, your person. And what what's really amazing is when I met you and all that, I would have never known that you did such a good job of keeping Jill's the Jill's in the house and building that. So you just never know. I guess the message there is you never know what somebody else is going through. It could be somebody just having a bad day or somebody that's really had a traumatic past that, that you can only, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't imagine in your worst dream. 
And so it just goes to show that, that, you know, that you had that. And I'm so glad that you overcame it. Uh, it, it pains me to know that you were suffering at that point. And there's not that I could have done anything about it, but you know, if you know, if you got a connection with somebody, you, you hate to see people suffer. But in this case, it, it, the end result of that uh, was you're in a better place. Part of, you know, my therapist gave me a line that I'll share with your, you and your listeners. She said, we are all just little children wrapped in layers. There is no one who escapes childhood without some sort of trauma. And trauma for me was getting beaten up and my mother committing suicide or attempting suicide. My mother lived, she shot herself, she lived. But I say, but on purpose, maybe I should say, and trauma for someone who's getting bullied trauma for someone who had uh, you know, a house on fire and had to suddenly move. I think it's some of my friends have kind of said, well, yours, your case was just so bad. And I wanna be really clear that we're all little children wrapped in layers. All of a sudden, I'm definitely a lot more kind to people who I see are acting a little wackadoo because I'm like, okay, that's your inner child. But we can all, there's no barometer in terms of the amount of trauma you need to go get help. And I think that's really important because a lot of my friends have downplayed some stories they've told me and they've said, well, it's not as bad as what you went through. Yeah. That's, there is no barometer. There's no competition in terms of trauma. You can suffer trauma for practically any a car accident. Um, and it can happen at any t point too. So I, I want to give people grace and I'm so excited. You know, this, this therapy is, is right now in phase three clinical trials, though those tr clinical trials should wrap up in the fall. It's probably going to go to the FDA for approval in 2023. The FDA is already working with maps.org on this. The FDA is working with Johns Hopkins on psilocybin breakthrough therapy so we're going to be seeing a lot more options for people. I, I hope we're going to be seeing a lot more options for people to, to heal whatever their hurts are. So what can we do to go help support that? Because, you know, I've seen what it, it's done for you. Um, and so what can we do to do that, to go support that? Uh, well, I'll send you, I don't know about supporting it other than not supporting it. So you and I grew up at a time where, uh, we had a lot of stereotypes about drugs and about psychedelics. I mean, there's one, there's a reason why I stayed away from them <laughs> for so long. So I think when we start to hear, I like in Pennsylvania, there's a bill to decriminalize uh, psychedelics in different states. It's happening. I would say that the best thing to do is to write a letter of support uh, or look up maps.org or Johns Hopkins and see what the research is and see if any of your friends or family can maybe get into a clinical trial right now before things become legal. I think what's most important and one of the reasons why I wanted to get my story out is that psychedelics are an easy target for people who don't know the healing modality to attack. And so I wanted to get my story out front and center and say, no, this is legitimate. This can really help people. Let's work on research. Um, I think that's a great thing. Tim Ferriss is somebody that I follow who's very interested in that space. And as soon as you go on Twitter, LinkedIn, LinkedIn has a ton of psychedelic company content because lots of companies are in a race to patent whatever chemical they can do to you know, have a therapeutic component. So I would just say, keep doing some reading, support research, and question if somebody all of a sudden starts bad-mouthing it, where are they coming yeah. from? Yeah, go back and follow the money, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it, as evidence, you know, we're, we're recording this in July, and, you know, over the holiday they had this this uh, young man who obviously was crying for help in many different things and for whatever reason wasn't able to get it, didn't get it. And that's really sort of the way I think that will stop a lot of these really bad things from happening is getting people removing the stigma from mental health and, and trying to get some help from that move that remove that stigma. And um, 
you know, treat the real nature of the problem, which is that inner child that has had to be locked away for whatever reason that went on. And so I, I want to thank you for sharing your story. You know, it's been wonderful talking with you again. We haven't talked in a while. And I very probably again, we'll put all those links in the show notes and stuff on that one. And mm-hmm. what's the best way to get a hold of you if, if somebody wants to sort of just sort of talk to you or get a hold of you? Oh, uh, real simple, www.jillsitnick.com, uh, J-I-L-L-S-I-T-N-I-C-K. You can reach out, say hi, uh, happy, to, happy to talk. And I'm getting on, I'm getting to chat with lots of cool people like you, so people get to hear my story. So. Well, cool, that's excellent with that. So Jill, thank you very much again. Take care of yourself, keep up the good fight, and uh, we'll talk again. We will. We will.